Recently, I saw a tweet that showcased NetSH, the Windows command line utility used as a low bin or living off the land binary that could be used for code execution or persistence. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is really neat. But it turns out, hey, this is actually a very well-known technique. This is some tradecraft that has actually been seen for a few years and is covered in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. There are pen tests or I read team notes for it. There's even a GitHub repository from Outflank that showcases some of the code alongside Og tweets showcase and I just thought you know what maybe this would be cool even if it has been done before to maybe take it up a notch up the ante and do something else that could be a little bit different other than you know pop on our cheesy calculator. So in this video I'm gonna get us spun up with Sliver. If you aren't familiar Sliver is one of the new coolest hottest whatever sweet sweet spot on the street uh, command and control framework put together by Bishop Fox. Sliver is very very slick it looks like folks even equate it to Cobalt Strike but of course a little bit more uh, freely available and accessible utility here. You do have a one-liner to get it started within Linux. So I'm inside of my Kali Linux virtual machine and I realize this curl pipe to bash is usually what people don't suggest, especially if you just grab code off the internet and slap it in and execute it. But I'm trusting and we'll see this thing in action. So let me fire up a terminal. I'll hit control alt T. I'll zoom in on my terminal and I will go ahead and curl pipe to sudo bash, which sounds extremely dangerous and really probably is just as bad as we're saying, but we can pull it down. It is going to prompt for my password even through curl. So I am gonna enter Kali, just the username and password here, and I'll let this pull down. If you aren't working with Sliver, you should do the very same. Okay, now since Sliver is set up with mainly sudo and root permissions, I will have to sudo bash to get into Kali Linux and the root prompt here. Now you'll note, hey, I do have a Sliver client and a Sliver server all accessible to me, but I should just be able to spin up Sliver and now I can fire this thing up. And I have the command and control framework nice and easy on my command line. You could equate this to Empire or maybe Covenant, right? Mythic, of course, some other sweet stuff. It's just a little bit more, I don't know, sexy than Metasploit and Meterpreter. However, it has some options to be able to do a lot of Metasploit and Meterpreter-like things. In fact, I think it does a little bit for generating implants, sessions, and beacons. And if we wanted to learn more, we could dig into their wiki here. Scrolling through their readme, you can check out some of the features and some of the awesome stuff that it might do. And the wiki is really where we could learn a little bit more. One thing to note here is that they make a distinction on their implants between a beacon versus a session. Sliver is generally designed as a stage two payload and we haven't tried to minimize the implants file size. Let me say Sliver is I think put together in Golang and uses Golang binaries and Golang code for everything that it tends to do. And that makes for massive, ginormous, egregious and humongous implant size, especially when we're trying to cut together shell code. It even made an issue when I was trying to get the shell code in to our NetSH helper DLL that we'll showcase in a moment. <laughs> Here they recommend we strongly advise using stagers for actual operations because it is put together in Golang. Right Now these differentiate between beacon mode and session mode, but we can generate implants just as easily using whatever protocols you might like, even WireGuard, HTTP, or MTLS. I won't go into all the specifics on the protocols and what they're putting together here, but you can see just how easily you can generate a session or a beacon. But we do want to dig into stagers, right? So it notes that you must have MingGW installed if you aren't trying to build out some like Windows DLLs or get things staged. And again, payloads can be massive, like 10 megabytes, too much to cram into maybe a binary in some cases, if you are just trying to embed shell code in. So you could put things together with a stager. And they note, hey, you can put together a little bit of Metasploit, MSF Venom, Interpreter stuff in the action here. But if you wanted to just build things, you could use a new profile. That is how stagers actually ride off that capability. We'll define a new profile with our IP address, the shell code format that we want, create a listener to get this thing going, and then we could go ahead and uh, run it. So forgive me, let me put these side by side here. And inside of Sliver, let's create a new profile with that MTLS representation. My IP address of my attacker VM is 192.168.111.166. We'll specify the format as shellcode and we'll just call it Windows shellcode as they reference. Now we've created that profile and we'll want to stage a listener with stage tag listener. You can use that URL for of course our server and that would again be our host 111.166. And I'll listen on port 9001 because it's over 9000. Profile can be our win shellcode. And then we should be able to spin that up. It'll compile that for me. 
Okay, looks like it has put together Electoral Anger, which is a phenomenal name for this. And we do have that shellcode ready and available for us. We can see that we do have the jobs running for our HTTP stager, but we do need to actually generate the stager payload itself. That's over here, right? So let's go ahead and use generate stager. L host will be my host. Port can be, I don't know, 8888, doesn't matter. And that should be L port, forgive me. Protocol. We know we were working with HTTP for our listener and we can go ahead and save that into just a temporary directory, that's fine. And it'll put that together for me. Okay, my sliver implant stager is saved to temp sound shell. I'm digging that name here. Let me open that up just so we can see it. Again, I will need root permissions because it is something that uh, we actually saved as root, but of course it's just a binary file, all the bytes for our shell code. Now we've generated shell code to run, but I do have to note, uh, we probably really should be spinning up our own NetSH helper in a DLL and compile that so that we can use this low bin technique. We're gonna get to that, but I, now we have all the breadcrumbs and puzzle pieces that we'll need to be able to build that. Actually, if you're having fun with us so far and you're doing a whole lot of these in your own red team's penetration test ethical hacking, you should totally check out our sponsor, PlexTrack. When you're performing a penetration test, you're in the zone. You're hacking away and you're having fun, gathering findings, beating up vulnerabilities and earning domain admin. But you might be dreading the work that comes after. You have to write a report. But writing a pen test report doesn't have to be dull and boring and long and tedious. In fact, it can be a breeze. You don't even have to worry about your report because PlexTrack can handle it for you. If you aren't familiar, PlexTrack is the premier cybersecurity reporting and collaboration platform that makes penetration testers, red teamers, and cybersecurity teams more efficient, effective, and proactive. PlexTrack removes the pain of reporting and lets you collaborate between both red and blue teams for effective purple teaming and faster remediation. The PlexTrack platform lets you easily aggregate findings, pull in reusable content from write-up databases and content libraries, and track and measure engagement progress in real time. Import assets from CSV files or Nmap or Nessus and so many others of your favorite tools. With over 25 integrations, you can streamline your reporting and collaboration process right into your existing workflow. You can do even faster testing with PlexTrack runbooks and show the impact to managers and leadership with PlexTrack's analytics and visualizations. Within minutes, you can have your pen test report done and dusted, all with your team's logo and details, and then sent off to the client. Spend more time hacking and less time reporting. Learn how you can boost your team's efficiency by 30% and cut reporting time by up to 65% with PlexTrack. Seriously, check out PlexTrack. I have great colleagues and peers that use PlexTrack every day for reporting. Get started with my link below in the video description and let you and your team get back to hacking. Huge thanks to PlexTrack for sponsoring this video. Okay, our Sliver C2 implant and stager is saved. We have the shell code ready for use. Our jobs are running. We have the handler listener waiting to catch it. Our command and control framework is set, but now we have to switch gears and actually build out the harness that lets us build and use this net helper DLL. So I'm switching over to a Windows development machine and I am going to open up a web browser because I want to go grab that outflank source code here. Outflank NL did have a NetSH beacon helper that we could probably just ride off of. Outflank does a really good job showcasing this, putting it all together. And again, it is a bit old and dated, but it works. If you want to dig through it, you can see how you could with all of this in the readme here. What I'm going to do is just go grab the source code. We do have the C++ source code here. I'll view the raw representation of that so I can just copy and paste all the syntax. Now I'll go ahead and open up Visual Studio so that I can mess with it and make it. I'm going to create a new project. We can go ahead and make sure the language is C++. I'll go ahead and search for a DLL, and that is what I want to be carving out out here, we can make this like NetSH uh, helper. How about that? We can create that down below, that button in the bottom right, my face is covering it. But once we spin this up, we can copy and paste that code in and see if we can compile this A-OK. -okay. okay, so this has given me the generic code for a DLL. We can remove all this. I wanna keep that include because Visual Studio tends to whine and yell at me if I don't actually create that all here. And system, I'm totally okay with removing. We don't really need to pop calc uh, as a showcase and it was whine and erring anyway. We could go ahead and remove some of these comments and fingers crossed we would 
be able to compile this. Let me go ahead and hit Control uh, Shift B or Build Solution up here, and it looks like one succeeded down below. So we are able to build this and create our DLL. Now we want to go ahead and swap out the shellcode here, because what this does it just defines hey the standard format for NetSH helpers. The function name needs to be init helper DLL, and it takes in these arguments, and you can see the documentation that references all that here. Since we want to make sure NetSH will still actually execute and run and not crash and die, we end up creating a thread and that thread is what's going to end up taking the shell code that we've defined and then using the usual, okay, virtual alloc to get it into memory for our own current process and then running and executing our shell code. Now let's go ahead and swap out the shell code that they have here with the one that we want to run. Let me remove this guard. I'm not really too concerned with the other kinds of shell code, whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit, but let's get back into Kali Linux and let's go grab our shell code. What I'm going to do is actually run my little uh, NIM script that will take this binary or the shellcode binary, right, and actually end up spitting it out into shellcode that we can use, like the backslash x representation. Uh, this is on GitHub. It's something stupid that I made because I wanted to be able to take that binary and just make it in that format. Uh, you can specify the width if you want quotes, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but we want to be able to run this on temp, uh, what is that? sound shell. There we go. Oh, and we don't need help. We just need to actually pass in that file now. So that is all the syntax and we can copy and paste this. Here we go. I'll right click copy. Back into my Windows development machine. Let me go ahead and remove this big long string of shell code that they started with and I'll add a semicolon at the very, very end here. So we'll be able to create all of this for me. Now let's control shift B one more time to try and build this. One succeeded, zero failed, zero up to date, yada, yada, yada. And oh, I actually compiled that into bug mode. Let me switch that to release and I'll rebuild it one more time. Now, once that is spit together, we can go ahead and grab this location where it actually put it. It build it into this NetSH uh, helper release file. So what I'm gonna do is actually get into my terminal because inside of this development machine, I do have uh, Defender completely removed. So our antivirus is nerfed, killed. There's a YouTube video where I showcase how we could do that. So I didn't want it to get in the way of any actual malicious security research code. What I'm going to do is actually spin this up with Python uh, so I can get it into another virtual machine. And what is my IP address actually? Let me open up another terminal. I am 149 in the side of this development machine. Okay. So now I'm going to actually spin over to yet another virtual machine. And here we are. This will be our victim. So I'm going to go ahead and navigate to my 192.168.11 one dot one four nine on port eight thousand Good enough. Now I have my NetSH helper DLL that we have compiled. So let me go ahead and download that. I'm totally cool with it, Edge. You can go ahead and keep it. Yeah, yeah, NetSH helper DLL, whatever. Now that is stored currently in my downloads. So what we can do is now use that NetSH command and see if we get our callback. So I'm gonna break these out into two separate screens so you can see both the Kali Linux machine as our attacker and the victim as our web root testing. And we can go ahead and open up our terminal. And a reminder, you will We'll need administrator privileges to be able to add this to NetSH. Creating the helper relies on being able to modify the registry, so this is meant to be some post-exploitation, hey, maybe after you've compromised the application and actually build out uh, your persistence mechanism or your other code execution that you might mask in, I don't know, some innocent script that looks benign but is actually malicious. You could really do whatever you want here. So what I will do is run NetSH and I want to add helper on my C users user down downloads, downloads, uh, net sh helper dot DLL. Now, fingers crossed, the moment I hit enter, this will tell me, okay, and nothing has come back yet because we've just staged it. NetSH still needs to actually run and execute to see this thing in action. So let me run NetSH and fingers crossed. Oh goodness, I hope so. No, still nothing. It's running. Did I stage my stager correctly? No, I forgot the port number. All right, let me uh, respin that one more time and rebuild this stager. I got the port numbers wrong because when we created our stage listener, we put it on 9001 and I should have used that down here for the actual stager L port. Uh, so let me regenerate and rebuild some of this. That's A-OK. -okay. We'll be super quick. This is actually a pretty worthwhile note here because while we generated our new stager, we can again use our uh, binim to be able to work with that and get the proper shellcode representation. However, this gives me an opportunity to showcase over on the victim side, if we open up our registry editor, 
they actually do leave some artifacts and that is worth knowing. In the Reg Hive HK Local Machine Software Microsoft NetSH, you can see my NetSH helper is already present there because it, it modifies the registry. And that is where you could kind of stage a couple of this. I'm gonna go to have to delete that. So I'd actually don't have that artifact when I try to recreate it and do it again. So A-OK, -okay, let's go ahead and rip Binim and I'll speed through this process as we know. Binim competitive market, we can go ahead and spit all that out. I will grab that syntax, copy, bring that into my development machine. Let's go ahead and get that new shell code staged. Compile and rebuild, good, good. Web root testing, we can go ahead and remove the DL that has been downloaded. Let's refresh this page and grab the new one. We should be able to save and keep that. Now let's get back to our NetSH command line. Let's go ahead and add that helper that we've created, A-OK, -okay, nothing new new, run NetSH, and fingers crossed, I'm still wrong. Let me double check. We have our profiles that are listening on quad eight. You can see that there is the port. So now we have our jobs. Oh, you know what? We haven't even started our listener. We need to actually make sure that MTLS is running as a job to be able to catch that. Can I search for jobs? Okay, now we have MTLS running on quad eight. My goodness. Now that we actually have our listener running, we can get back to our victim and we do still have it saved in registry. If I refresh this with F5, NetSH helper has been added, but the moment that I invoke NetSH, we should see our callback. There it is. Whew. Finally. <laughs> so take a look. Here's our session from 192.168.111.129, win 11, our victim machine. And we could go ahead and use that session. I'll hit tab to autocomplete. And here we are. Now I can just simply ls and we are in whatever directory that we happen to be in. I can pwd, we're in user. I can run help inside of this session and we can do all the cool stuff that Sliver would allow us to do. Kill sessions, hey, get some info, execute shell code, manage extensions, go interactive with a shell, dump process memory, and even take a cheesy little screenshot that we can go ahead and do. We'll go ahead and save that out. And then back in our, I don't know, a little uh, bash prompt as root, we could go ahead and open that up. Let me use Ristretto on that. And <laughs> there is our screenshot of the victim, of course, just running NetSH. Not that sexy, but if I had regedit it open or something, it would look good. Okay, a couple speed bumps, a couple mishaps, but you know what? We got it. And that's the fun of security research putting all the puzzle pieces in place and at least demonstrating, look, a cheesy Sliver C2 implant session and beacon that we can interact with through that NetSH helper DLL that we got to compile and build out with our own shellcode and stage it all as a lolbin. We aren't digging into the persistence or whatever other things other than the code execution. Obviously, if you want to stage this as a scheduled task or a service or auto run, you know how you could put together whatever persistence mechanism for this. If I may, I will note that I tried to put this together within NIM and I believe it is working. Uh, I'll showcase this in a GitHub repository, but it's just, hey, taking of a, what would be a NIM DLL that you could see the syntax for in the offensive NIM repository, creating the thread the same way that we did in the outflank C++, C++ code. Uh, and then of course, our own shell code that bin NIM, that stupid little uh, NIM project that I wrote earlier will uh, actually cut up and put in the right representation. This is just popping calc, uh, but let me show you that extremely fast because I know it doesn't matter. I will spin this up as a server. Let me get back to the victim. Let's go to 166, which is our attacker virtual machine. Let's go ahead and grab our scratchpad.dll, which is perfect. We can go ahead and save that. I'll get back to my command line and I'll exit out and I'll add another helper for my downloads and I'll actually add scratchpad.dll. This should just pop calc. And there it is. Cool, cool. Super simple, super easy, but at least we built that in NIM to have a little bit more flexibility in the code that we might want to run. And it did it even on the add helper command, so you could use that for what it's worth. Alrighty, hey, I had a whole lot of fun putting this one together. It was really, really cool to play with Sliver. I'd love to know if you would like to see more of that. I'd want to get a whole lot smarter on it. We barely scratched the surface and all the things that it can do. Just a simple callback right now. And NIM is always a little bit fun and getting a little bit lower level in C is pretty slick. So uh, being able to write that stuff to like bin NIM as a simple tool to be able to cut up shellcode, that was just nice and fun and I had a great time and I hope you enjoyed this video. Maybe learned something new, added a new tool, added something else to your arsenal. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do the YouTube algorithms like comment subscribe and please pretty please give some love to our sponsor they're the reason that we can keep creating out uh videos and content and stuff like this check out plex track <laughs> so bad at outros i'll see you in the next video